It is my absolute pleasure to be here. And um, I'm so excited to be here with three contributors from Rural Voices. So um, I want to go ahead and introduce them and then we will get started. So um, first up, we have David Bowles, who is a yeah, he's a Mexican American author from South Texas, where he teaches at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. He has written several titles, um, most notably the award winning The Smoking Mirror and They Call Me Guero. Um, his work has been published in multiple anthologies and magazines. In 2017, David was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters. Shamile Mendez is a football obsessed Argentine American who loves meteor showers, summer astrology and pizza. She lives in Utah with her Puerto Rican husband and their five kids, two adorable dogs and one majestic cat. An inaugural Walter Dean Myers grant recipient. She's also a graduate of Voices of Our Nations and the Vermont College of Fine Arts MFA Writing for Children's and Young Adult Program. She's a picture book, middle grade, and YA author. Shimile is also part of Las Musas, the first collective of women and non-binary Latinx, middle grade, and YA authors. Her newest book, Furia, was a Reese's Book Club selection. Tears of Price grew up on a farm in Michigan where she read every book she could get her hands on and never outgrew her love for YA fiction. She holds an MFA in writing for children and young adults from Vermont College of Fine Arts and is a contributing editor at Book Riot. When she's not writing, reading, or thinking about YA books, she splits her time between experimenting in the kitchen and knitting enough socks to last the fierce Michigan winters. Her debut novel, Pride and Premeditation, will be released from Harper Teen in March 2021. So um, thank you guys for joining us. I'm so grateful to talk to you. Um, and the whole goal of Rural Voices is to break the rural monolith, which is this idea that so many people across America have that all rural places and people are the same. Your stories are all so incredibly different um, in setting, in voice, in the protagonists. And so I wanna make sure the audience gets a sense of the different flavors of each of them. David, we'll start with you. Um, your short story is in verse. Can you briefly describe your story and where it takes place and speak a little bit about why you chose that form? And, um, and maybe also how does writing a verse story differ from writing a prose story? Yeah, so um, the, the, uh, the story that I contributed takes place in deep South Texas where I live just minutes from the Rio Grande River. And it's um, about um, a teenage boy who is queer um, in a Mexican American family that has shown a lot of intolerance towards, um, towards queerness. And he's about to come out, but he also wants to try to get his family to understand um, how small-minded they're being uh, and, and try to illustrate to them that the fight that they've had to endure over the decades um, for some sense of equality in the United States um, should make them a little bit more open to these possibilities and not to be so oppressive of people um, who are d different from them, yet also part of the same community. Um, I, I wanted to go with, you know, I, I had written a novel in verse, they call me Güero, um, and I really liked the verse form because of what it kind of uh, allows you to do. Um, rather than the, you know, the normal flow of a short story, each um, each individual poem is going to stand on its own, right? And, and so that's the trick. How do you tell a, a complete story um, by using like these individual pieces that are poems in and of themselves, and yet when they're strung together, there is this sense of completeness and continuity. It was, it was really, really tricky, and I love doing that kind of stuff. I mean, it gives... Uh, it's, it's a challenge and allows you to tell a story in a different way. And it's just I grew up in, a, you know, in this kind of, you know, backwater, like what we say in Spanish, in Mexican Spanish, you say, un rancho, you know, you live on a, on a it's not literally a ranch, but like in this, you know, <laughs> one horse town or whatever, um, you, you tend to get creative with what you have, uh, you know, around. And one of the things that people do in a lot of rural communities is to make quilts and quilts, you make quilts out of whatever you have lying around. And um, it strikes me that 
writing things in verse, whether short stories or novels, is a bit like quilt making. You're taking these individual pieces that have their own color and their own design, and you're arranging them in a way that when you step back, you look at it and you're like, yeah, I get it. There's this, this lovely pattern. Um, and so that was that's what it's like doing it. And, and it is, you know, I was a little worried. Um, I was, you know, I, I was, I sent the package of, of poems and I'm like, hopefully they'll get it and hopefully they'll see how these things all connect together. Um, and uh, you did, and we were able to to do the kinds of tweaks that was that that brought that quilt together nice and tightly. Um, and I think it's really successful. I'm teaching a class on writing novels in verse, and this past Monday was the the first um, night of six nights, and I read it to them, and everybody was like, you know, they, they responded really well. And it was the first time I had read it out loud, and by the end, I was kind of like crying because it, it does have this like really emotional like in ending. Um, so I think it was successful if it, I don't know, I cry very easily. So it, it making me cry is not necessarily a good measure of its power. Um, but I like it. I, 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 I definitely think of myself as a poet before I'm an author, before I'm a translator. So it was nice to play around with that form. Oh, I love that so much. It was such, or it is such a powerful story. I remember when I got it and I was just like, oh my gosh. And Kaylin, the acquiring editor, like we had like the same response. We were like, oh, it's so good. So it, it's, it's really powerful. Um, yeah. And I love that metaphor too, because I kind of feel like it's the same with anthologies, right? Like you, each story is like its own quilt piece and figuring out like, how they go together and the order to put them in and like, you know, why, why we're doing, um, why we're doing what we're doing and connecting all these dis, you know, seemingly different pieces that all have so much actually in common um, into one beautiful fabric. So I love that. Thank you. So um, let's see. Shamile, your story centers around a teen who wants to be the next rodeo queen. And I admit that before you told me your story idea, I didn't even know that rodeo queening was a thing. <laughs> and it turns out it's like this really big sport in the West. So that's just another example of how, you know, just because you're rural in one area doesn't mean you're anything like um, rural in another area. So um, can you briefly describe your story and how you got the idea for it? Um, I would love to hear about that. Okay, hi everybody and thank you for having me and thank you Nora for having me in this wonderful anthology. And when I got the invitation, I was so excited because I've lived in Utah for more than half of my life and uh, pretty all of my adult life. And sometimes when I go out of state and people find out that I live in Utah, the, 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 their reaction is always one of shock or and asking why would you live there and I'm sure you have no friends from your culture and it's so it's actually so off the mark of what uh, my reality is because Utah is a very diverse place especially the place where I live I live half an hour south of Salt Lake in a little town called um, Alpine which was my inspiration for Andromeda Utah and so you're very close to the interstate, but if you drive five minutes away, you're in deep farm country. And uh, we have dairy farms and sheep farms where you can see the, the, the sheep being born in the, in the spring. And that's always a magical experience. And then of course you have the whole rodeo uh, sport that I, I it, my story is not on voices in this sense that I, I, I never, uh, when queening, and that's the proper term for it, but I've have a, a lot of people in my community have, and I've always been in such awe of the athleticism and all the other attributes that that require um, for that are required for these children to to grow in this sport. So in my story, I, Island Rodeo Queen is about Coralie, whose family is from Puerto Rico. And they moved to Utah when she was a very young girl. So like it's the reality of a lot of young immigrants. She is immediately immersed in the culture that where she lives right now. And she doesn't feel like she's an outsider. And of course, because all of her friends are participating in rodeo and queening, she wants to be part of this world. Also her family in Puerto Rico, she's still very close to them. And especially with her grandma, Irma, who uh, went through the hurricane that, the two hurricanes that went through Puerto Rico uh, three years ago. 
And I was actually writing the, the first draft right after the aftermath, aftermath of the hurricane. So that was a, a very emotional time to be expressing my feelings about uh, how the hurricane affected the island. And my husband's Puerto Rican, I'm, I, but I have lived in the island and I, I love our family and friends that, that live there. So I really, the, the feelings of Godali struggling to help her family that stayed behind uh, came from my, my own lived experience. And so also Puerto Rico has a very rich culture of uh, women and girls participating of beauty pageants. Uh, in fact, one of the main reasons Puerto Ricans do not want to become the 51st state is because they do not want to give up their, their participation in Miss Universe as an independent country. So, <laughs> and so Coralie's family uh, had been very active in the Miss Universe pageant. So Queenie is kind of like the merging of her two worlds. And she feels like it's a, just a normal thing for, for her to pursue until she starts getting a lot of uh, negativity from her community. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of positivity because she, uh, the community, uh, a lot of the community rallies around her to, to support her in, in her dream of becoming the next rodeo queen. And I do not want to spoil the story, but there is not a conclusive ending. Uh, pretty much the climax has to do with her internal journey and how she comes to term with the fact that sometimes we believe that to be, um, and the word I'm gonna ask you, David, because you are the linguist and the language specialist and I, I'm gonna hope that you can read my mind. So when immigrants come to this country, they're ex expected to uh, assimilate. Assimilate, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so to assimilate, sometimes we equate it with shedding the culture that we left or the, 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 our traditions and our foods and pretty much everything that makes our families who they are. But uh, in reality, assimilating means to embrace all the things that make us who we are. Uh, Puerto Ricans have been US citizens since uh, World War I. And sometimes even when people talk about uh, Puerto Ricans moving to, to the mainland, they say they immigrate, they're not immigrants because they are just moving from territory to territory. But I know because I see it a lot in my own family, this uh, war inside them to find their identity because Puerto Rico is very much still a, a US colony. And even when they move to the mainland, Puerto Ricans remain fearfully attached to their island. And, uh, but they struggle also with wanting to, to be one more in America. So it was very fun and interesting and cathartic to, ex to explore all these things in the story. And I hope that when people read it, they'll be inspired to find out more about Queening because the, it's way more than, than the beautiful outfits and the horses. But it, it, I hope that they can see that there's a lot of courage and athleticism and community, which is what we human beings all need as a species to survive. Well, I love your story so much. It's so beautiful. And it really, like you said, with the climax being about her identity, that is like the heart of the story. But I also love the athleticism that you talked about, like how you show that there is this really, um, you know, you have to be strong. You have to, it both mentally and physically. And you see Coralie like having these struggles, but on top of that, having these struggles with who she is and, you know, where, where does she belong? You know, does she have to choose one place or the other? And it's just such a powerful, um, a powerful story. So I think you did a great job. I hope everyone reads it. <laughs> Um, okay, so Tirza, you were the first person actually that I contacted when I had this idea for Rural Voices and you were so excited. Um, you immediately said you'd write a story and I'm forever grateful to you for encouraging me throughout the entire process. Um, would you briefly describe your story, please, um, where it takes place and its inspiration? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I was, I, I mean, I feel like I have to clarify because I'm not sure if you so much like invited me as to be like, I have this idea. And I was like, yes, 
I am in. I, I, no, I invited I totally myself. Invited you. I, totally did. I wouldn't have texted you otherwise. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so yes, my story is called Best in Show, and it is set in rural Michigan in the Lower Peninsula. Um, so very near to where I grew up. I kind of made up my own um you know, community, but it's definitely based off of, you know, where I am and I still live here. So, and it's also drawing from my experiences as a 4-H kid, because I can think of like maybe a handful of middle grade novels and like no YA novels that really address that experience. And for me growing up in middle school and high school, like 4-H was a big part of, of my life. Like I was very involved and I showed pigs. So I, that's, you know, just a very, um, I think interesting thing, like if you've ever seen a pig show, they're kind of wild. And I know many outsiders will be watching and being like, what the heck is going on? Because it does look a little bonkers unless you know what people are doing. So um, I had like a lot of, um, I think I had a, a lot of short story drafts actually, because um, everything I write is rural set. And um, when you asked if I would be interested in being involved in this anthology, I was like, sure. And so it was, I went back to this idea of this 4-H girl and how she, um, you know, was really good at 4-H, but not so great at like all the social aspects that come with being a teen. And that story sort of developed from, from there. So um, in my story, Molly is a 4-H teen. She is just starting her fair week, which is a very, very busy week for her. And she's feeling kind of focused and confident about showing her pig, but then she's kind of thrown off kilter a little bit when her crush, who she kind of thought was, you know, maybe not into her, actually is interested in her. And rather than like, allowing that to be a rush of confidence, it really kind of sets her spitting. So she has to kind of find confidence in who she is and reconciling the various aspects of her identity. So that is, um, yeah, that's my short story. And I'm so grateful that you allowed me, you invited me or allowed me to invite myself into this anthology because I think it's so important. Yeah, one of the things that I really love about your story is that right off the bat, it shows how, um, you know, it opens and there are these outsiders on vacation and they're, you know, kind of gawking at your main character and her pig. And, um, and I, that experience just resonates with me a lot, like not specifically about showing pigs because I, I never did that, but, um, just really about the idea that rural people like are just different or weird or, um, you know, anything that we do that's different, like, the idea of kind of being like, oh, isn't that so cute? Or like, look how southern you are. Or, you know, um, it that really resonated with me. So I love that you open with that and that your characters get some nice digs in there too. It's kind of fun. Yes. So that actually <laughs> happened to me. So that was, that was based oh. off of a real experience. And for many years, I considered this like my most embarrassing moment ever. And I was probably 15 or 16 and it was you know, this day before fair starts and I'm washing my pig in the wash rack. And I, it was such a hot day because they always hold fair in July. And it's like the hottest week of the year. And this pig is not having it because pigs get stressed out in the heat and they get stressed out when you move them. So he was just like, no, I'm done. And I'm scrubbing him. And I look up and this guy's taking my photograph and he was just completely unapologetic, just like, oh, sorry. I haven't ever seen anybody give a pig a bath. I'm from Chicago. And he like walks away and I looked like a fright, I'm sure. And I was so embarrassed by that as a teenager, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I was like, I had nothing to be embarrassed about. That guy was rude. So yes, <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, you got to use it in a story. So yes. who's got the laugh laugh now? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, um, Oh my gosh, the time is going so fast. All right, we're going to keep moving on. Um, let me pull up my little question. Hold on. Okay, so David, I want to hop back to you for a second. Um, one of the many things that I love about your story is that um, it actually connects to one of your award-winning books. Um, um, so the middle grade novel, they call me Guerno. Um, a border kid comes of age takes place four years after that book. So I'm wondering why did you decide to do that? And did you immediately know that's the story that you wanted to include in Rural Voices? 
And because you already had an established character, were there any challenges that you faced because of that? Or was the story actually easier to write because you already knew that character so well? Yeah, well, the story was easier for me to write, but I had to think about the fact that people who haven't read the Call Me Guero need to be kind of like reintroduced to him. So I made sure to have, you know, these two standalone poems um, happening in the restaurant and then just like, like an overview of what's happening in his neighborhood so that people get a feel for what his life's like, what his family's like, it's like that, just you know, quick little microcosms. But yeah, I mean, when I was writing the Call Me Guero, um, it's, it's not, uh, kids when I do school visits always ask me, is this your life? And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> I mean, 30% of it is drawn from my own life. I mean, I'm 50. I grew up in the 70s and 80s and Guero lives like right now. And he's a Mexican American kid in a rural uh, area of South Texas during, you know, within in here and um, this wonderful 2020 of ours. I guess it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be 2019. But um, I drew from my own life. And when I was trying to figure out like how to tell the story of a Mexican American kid on the border um, in the present age, you know, in Trump's America or whatever you want to call it, um, I carefully selected things that uh, from my own experience and then blended them with things from my son's experience and from the lives of uh, Mexican American boys that I taught as a middle school and high school teacher and stuff like that and tried to create this amalgam. And, so, you know, I, I knew that a couple of poems were going to be like darker and he was going to be struggling with bullying and just like the national conversation about Mexican Americans and the border. But I didn't want to go like too dark into to like personal issues because I'm writing about a 12 year old in this for middle grade and I didn't want to get too uh, maudlin and, and um, you know, interior interiorize his struggle too much. Um, but I, I knew that at some point I wanted to write sequels to the book, um, maybe a couple of middle grade sequels and definitely a YA sequel uh, that I knew was going to be about uh, Guero discovering that he's queer, that he's bisexual, and what that means, what it means to be a bisexual Mexican American teen in a rural community. It's frankly a nightmare. <laughs> and so, um, like, trying to like pull from my own experience and, and the experience of other people um, and, and write that story, it was important to me. And when when you reached out to me, I knew that that was a story I wanted to tell. Um, I thought it would be a powerful story, um, a part of both the Mexic, of both Mexican American life and a rural life that people don't always think about, like what it's like to be both part of a community that is separate from the rest of the world and looked at strangely as Tirsa was talking about and, and also um, Jamile, but, um, but also within that community to be different from people in the community. And Vero was about that being different in terms of skin color because Vero means light skinned and he's a light skinned Mexican American who's essentially white passing. Um, and, and the book is about, you know, the, the middle grade book is about like, what do you do with that privilege when you're 12 years old? How do you learn to grapple with it? But I wanted to then turn to um, the darker side of that and like what happens when your community um, hurts you because you're different from them. And, and you, you, you're a part of that community and you're, you're willing to defend them you know, tooth and nail, but there's a point at which you have to say, hey, y'all are wrong and y'all need to stop this shit. You need, we need to, to respect one another and you are hurting me and hurting people like me. Um, and I, so I thought it was important to grapple with because we can, you know, I've always lived in small communities. Um, I live in the, in, the, in the right outside of the town of, of Donna, which is one of the smallest and poorest communities in, in South Texas. And I, I tend to like be really protective of small towns and, and uh, portray them in really positive light because I just I want to do that kind of work. But it's also true that there's darkness here and, and, and it's important to admit that and be able to look at both um, aspects of a rural life. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Shamile and Tirza, have either of you considered expanding your pieces into a full length novel? Can I answer first? I have my own, yes. Yes, I, I, I would love to. I don't have any, any concrete plans yet, but I am writing a, a more rural stories and I'm doing kind of the opposite that David is, it did because instead of going from middle grade to YA, I'm going from YA to middle grade. And I have a, a horse series coming out 
in 2022 about this girl who has a gift with horses. And it's a different character from Coralie, but working through Coralie's story, it gave me the spark to find uh, this new character and her relationship to horses. And so I, I would love to explore more of Coralie and Trenton though, because I love writing uh, YA romance and I think they have a cute thing going on right there. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And as a former, I mean, former, I'm still kind of a horse girl. I'm so excited for your series, Shamile. It's going to be so great. Um, yes, I have thought about expanding um, Molly's story. However, like Shamile, I don't have any concrete plans right now. Um, I just have a lot of story ideas and a lot of things kind of like in the immediate um, future. Uh, but yeah, it would be really, really fun. Um, and I would love to just get back to writing more rural set stories. Um, earlier, I have like said that all of my YA and middle grade that I've ever written has mostly been rural set. And then I kind of um, did a little bit of a switch and I'm writing genre fiction right now, but I, yes, I would really love to get back to that. Awesome. So I want to, before we get to a and a I just want to um, ask all of you, because we always get this question, can you, we'll start with you, Tirza, and kind of go backwards, but can you talk about the difference between writing a short story and writing a novel? Like <laughs> the amount of work? <laughs> I don't know. Um. Or, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but like, how is... Um, uh. Um, I guess like, so if somebody is used to writing novels and wants to, you know, work on a short story, what's something that they need to keep in mind or vice versa, like maybe somebody has only written short stories, but they want to expand to a novel. What, what's kind of like, what's some craft stuff that is different? Um, I think, well, for me, writing short fiction, I have to really not hold back and, and just really kind of like laser in on the most like meaningful and impactful moments, I think, because I am definitely an overwriter. I'm trying to cure myself of this because I don't have time to overwrite. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm always, when I'm thinking about like what my ideas, what, what ideas will work, um, I think it's, it's, yeah, trying to zero in on like the most emotional moments and, um, and really just kind of keep that focus on that um, because you don't have a lot of room in short story to kind of, um, you know, just take up as much space and that that's just kind of, you know, the logistics. Um, I don't know. I feel like I am not as experienced as the rest of the writers in this room. So maybe David and Jamila will have some better answers to this. Uh, but uh, for me too, it's also, I, some some ideas are just definitely lend themselves to a shorter format um, and to some more experimental structures that I can try out in short stories versus novels. I mean, I really have to love an idea to stick with it for the months it takes to draft a novel, whereas short stories, they're a little bit more experimental in nature. And I, I write a lot of them and I can, I can pound them out in like a month or so. So yeah, those are the big differences, but I'll, I'll let everybody else answer. <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm laughing at David and Shamile's little um, chat exchange that they have going on because I also feel that way that it's so much harder to write a short story than if you write a novel. Shamile, you take it away. <laughs> well, I, for me, because I write through the whole spectrum from picture book to YA novels, you have such a limited space to explore an idea or a theme or a character and the, the fear once you have, the harder it is. So for me, writing picture books is excruciating it's also a very uh, it's an excellent exercise that that as a writer even if you if you don't consider yourself a picture book writer or a short story writer I invite you to try to 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 exercise those muscles because seeing story structure and character development in short form will be so beneficial to learn how to do it in the expanded novel form and some ideas will not lend themselves to, to write a full novel about, but, uh, and, and that's why they're so, it's so fun to be able to explore them in short, short story or picture book. And at the same time, when you're writing in short form, you need to go to the heart of it and weed out 
all the excessive plots. And like Pierce has said, I am an overwriter as well. And also because I write about this, the, uh, about communities and families. And in a short story, you can mention them and you can mention the relationship of the main character towards them, like a Coralie with her grandma or the boyfriend or the, or the rodeo queen in sh uh, coach. But you cannot go on a tangent and explore those character stories. So it has to be streamlined. And, and, and that's a hard exercise for me, but it's also fun to do. And, and yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. David, what do you want to add? No, I mean, they've covered everything pretty well. I mean, I would just say that, you know, like to dovetail off of what Jamila was saying, the my problem with short stories, and I've got a collection of short stories called Chupacabra Vengeance, but mm -hmm. um, it, they were produced over like decades because it's just so damn hard for me. Because I, I want to, pat, look, when I'm writing prose, I tend to like want to have um, all these different threads of, of the B plot and the C plot and stuff like that. Um, yeah. The short stories, obviously, you have to cut all that. I'm, it's easier for me to do that with poetry. As a result, writing, you know, a short story and poems was this kind of revelation to me. I was like, "Wow, okay, I can, I can handle this because I can th piece these things together," and it just was so much smoother. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I agree with the threads. Like, I, um, I'm also an overwriter, and when I first start, I, I just I have so many threads. So for the short story form to really cut it down to the heart of the story and maybe you know you can kind of hint at, at some other threads that you could explore in a longer piece you just you just can't do it in the same way as a short story mm -hmm. so um oh my gosh so I have more questions but I'm going to open it up to Q&A because I do think that we have some questions and I want to make sure that the audience gets to um to talk to these awesome authors Thank you so much, Nora. I, I want to start by just thanking all of you. Um, I've really enjoyed, have been enjoying listening to you talk this evening. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it's just been a real, it's just been a real pleasure. Um, and I appreciate you getting together uh, for this anthology. We've, we've had a lot of great conversations with, with authors lately, many of whom are um, authors who live here in Western North Carolina or in Appalachia. Um, and so the, there, there, it seems to me that there are more and more conversations about um, how we look at rural America, rural life, rural people, um, and, and how we do tend to sort of flatten out those experiences, um, either in general across the board, you know, with the, with the so-called rural urban divide, or, you know, specifically to regions, you know, where we kind of, you know, characterize everyone in sort of all one way. And, and of course, it's ridiculous to do that for any group of people, but, um, you know, uh, drawing a little bit more attention to, to this, um, I think is, is, uh, uh, is wonderful. And then of course, when you have great fiction coming out of it, that helps people connect to human experience. Um, that's what it's all about. So thank you all. Thank you all for, for speaking with us this evening. Um, so I, I would like to actually, um, ask a question uh, first um, of, of all of you. Uh, well, I'll start with Nora, because you, you talked with uh, Tirza a little bit about sort of having the idea and going to Tirza first, or Tirza volunteering herself, or <laughs> you know, that, that whole scenario. Um, but when, when did the idea spark for you? Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about yeah, how, how this project actually started and what your thinking was in the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. So I've always been, um, I'm always looking for authentic rural representation. And um, I didn't have a lot of it growing up. And actually, when I was in college, I took a class called Appalachian literature. And I admit that I talk a little bit about this in the acknowledgments where I admit like I wasn't actually really excited about this class. I was like, oh, I have to take this for my English major. And then it ended up being one of my favorite classes of the whole time. I mean, it was so awesome and it really opened my eyes to, to what literature can be and how we need to move beyond like what canon literature is by, you know, that has been written um, by these old white guys basically. And I mean, you know, great, there's a lot of great literature, but um, we, we need real, like when we're talking about rural stories, we need rural people telling these stories. And um, so, a few years ago, there, there was like an anthology boom in YA and I kept kind of like waiting to see like, okay, like here's going to be the 
the, the rural anthology, I can't wait, like it's going to be, and I, and it never happened. And I was, um, talking to my friends. I was actually writing with my friends, Mary Wynn and Rachel. And, um, and I kind of was complaining. I was like, Oh, you know, all these anthologies and no one cares about rural people, of course. And, um, and Mary Wynn was like, well, just, why don't you do this anthology? Like, why don't you do it? And I was like, what? I can't do it. Like my debut is not even out. Like who's going to sign up for this anthology with me? Like I'm no one. And, and she was like, well, you should just, just try, just see, you know? And I was like, okay. So I, um, you know, I talked to my agent and I texted Tirza and it was like, by the end of the day, the anthology was happening. Like people were excited about it. And like, I already had voice, like, like people, I mean, most people that I talked to wanted to do it immediately. Like I didn't like hardly have to wait at all for answers. Like a lot of people, um, you know, David, Tirza, Shamila, they were all like so excited. I got their answers back right away and it really gave me hope. And, um, and oh my gosh, like, you know, now the whole thing with Hillbilly Elegy and it's kind of like, oh, this is why like we wrote this story, you know, this is why we have this collection um, in the first place. So that's really what, what got it started. And it, it turns out like, it doesn't really matter. Like I, I was kind of like not giving myself enough credit, you know, like I'm a writer and people, if they care about um, these ideas, they, they want to get on board and, and share their voice. So that's kind of, that's, that's how it happened. <laughs> well, that's, that makes perfect sense. And is, and is a great story too. Um, I mean, I think a lot of wonderful projects start with frustration that nobody else is doing it. And then just deciding uh -huh. that you need to be the person to go on ahead and do it. <laughs> so yeah. Exactly. yeah. And I <laughs> think great. too, anthologies are often kind of love projects. A lot of times people, you know, you have to really be passionate about the subject to want to do it because it is a lot of work and, um, you know, it's a lot of wrangling of different authors, like, and, and, you know, to, to put this collection together, but it was, it was so worth it. Like, I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone that, um, and for Candlewick for being so excited about it from the beginning. Like, it's just, it's just been a great experience. Excellent. So Nora, we have a couple people, including some of the people you're sharing space with right now, who actually want to hear you talk a little bit about your story, because you're not just the editor. Um, and, and the person who spawned the idea, you actually contributed a story as well. Would you like to share? Good. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll try, I'll try to be quick so that other people can talk to you. Um, so my story is called Close Enough. And it also, like so many of the stories in, in this book, deals with the identity and this idea of whether, um, so the girl, Alina, in the story, she's really struggling with, even though she spent most of her life in rural West Virginia, um, she doesn't quite feel like she's West Virginian because um, she lives in a place where, you're born and bred to be West Virginia and all your family is there. And um, if you don't have family, like how can you really be West Virginia? Because like your roots aren't there, you know? And so she she has this inner turmoil um, where she doesn't really know what she is because everybody else thinks she's West Virginian, everybody else, and she, she doesn't know. So, and then um, it also, <laughs> I was really inspired to write this particular story by um, there's a bull in my story and um, that that kind of chases some characters um, and that actually happened to my mom and sister and so when that happened to them I was like oh my gosh I have to write this story like please let me write this story and they were like oh fine you know you can write the story and so it's like it's completely fictionalized of version of this but like that happened at our house like in the big field like with this loose bull and they like ran into the forest like just um and you know it was totally fine it was a friendly bull and everything but um <laughs> so that the bull makes an appearance in the story but yeah that's, that's great. Thank you uh, for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, um, animals, it's <laughs> play a role in a lot of what's happening here as, as they do in rural life. That's one of the, th you know, the sort of, um, and, and uh, um, such a, such a different and sometimes um, more extraordinary and outsized role than, um, you know, than, than folks who live in apartments, <laughs> you know, have experience with, obviously. Um, I, I did not grow up in a, in a rural space, um, uh, per, per se. I was, I was, um, in, uh, you know, in a, but it was in a small city and I was in a subset of that city. Um, 
and uh, and I and I don't mean to take too much time away from the actual stars of the show, but I just wanted to share that I was one time uh, chased by a crab um, because uh, we used to. Um, and I and I actually stopped eating meat two decades ago, but <laughs> but um, at the time as a kid, um, we used to have uh, crab boil. Um, and my grandparents who raised me and who, and who were raised in rural spaces themselves um, uh, used to go to, um, and it was, and, and we didn't go like to the, we didn't buy grocery, like fish at the grocery store, like you went to the fish market and bought fish or somebody, you know, um, like brought it by on a truck or whatever, it was that kind of situation. But we would go to the fish market and buy buckets of crabs, live crabs for crab boils. And one of them got loose one time and, and actually sort of ran after me. Uh, when I was oh little. Gosh. So <laughs> if, if any of you feel like incorporating that into a story sometime, please do. Um, <laughs> it's not quite as, it's not quite as dangerous or as thrilling as being chased by a bull. Um, uh, and thank you for indulging me and sharing that. But <laughs> it's one of the things that can happen with one life. Um, so, um, and actually I'm gonna, I, I need to scan through and see if we have any more questions because there's a lot of just like positive comments. So Nora, did you have more questions for the, for the panel? And then, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, I, um, so for the writers in the audience, cause I do know that there are some writers, um, let me see. Process was, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a different one. So what do, we'll start with David. What do you hope readers take away from Rural Voices? Like they can take away one main thing. Well, yeah, definitely that um, rural places are not all the same and they're not what you imagine them to be. And we know we get um, such horrible, I mean, you were, you were just referencing a piece of, recent entertainment that um you know paints a really horrible stereotypical distorted view of of rural life and um you know i've i've, I've struggled one of the hard things about being a writer and being like from texas and being from like literally the, the border south texas people think that texas ends at san antonio and there's like six <laughs> hours left of like the, there are states in new england that are smaller than the rest of texas after san antonio um is that people are like, well, why, why don't you move to like, you know, Los Angeles or Seattle or Washington, or whatever? And I'm like, no. I mean, all of my work is like deeply rooted in this place. How could I abandon it? I mean, I'll go, I'll fly out to to uh -huh. these places to go to meetings and conferences, but this is this is me. Um, and I I just hope that through this anthology, people get to see what's so appealing about living. And those of us who continue to live in these places, which is, you know basically all of us here, um, it, it's because there's there's something beautiful and lovely and meaningful about it. Um, and Shamile, I wonder if you can add on to that and um, not just what you want everybody to take away from rural voices, but what specifically would you like rural readers to take away, like rural teens? Oh, oh my goodness. I hope that they would be inspired to tell their own stories, that we need more. And this is just like I always mention uh, about any of my books and especially the anthologies that show a different a camera view of, of a certain part of the world, in this case, rural voices. It's, this is just a door that we're hoping to open for, for other people to, to come out and tell their own stories because uh, we always benefit when we join our voices. So I hope that they will be happy to see themselves represented. I know that thrill that you feel in your heart when somebody, when you see your name on the pages of a book or the name of your town or your state or the sport that you love that you might not be very known, but it's the center of your universe. So I hope that everybody has a chance to see themselves uh, in a story. And then, like I said, if you are inspired to, to, tell, to tell your own that, that, that you'll join us. Yes, it is possible. I love that because it's totally possible to be a writer, you know, no matter where you live. And um, I think sometimes talking to some rural teens, like they, they don't think that that's open to them, you know, like they're just so used to being shut down and told that they can't be certain things and that they only have certain paths open to them. Yeah. So I, I really love that. Tirza, what do you have anything to add? Um, so no, I mean, I think David and Shamila said it so wonderfully. And I guess, um, 
you know, I just hope that people, teens especially, rural teens, um, will read these stories and realize that they, sorry, the cat, he gets bitey after a while. <laughs> he wants attention, but he doesn't want too much attention. <laughs> he does not respect Zoom and now he's going to bite me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, the, you know, you don't have to leave your hometown. I think growing up when I was a teenager, all the stories that I read that were set in rural areas, it was always about how terrible the hometown was and how they couldn't wait to get out. And like, I think there are definitely, you know, advantages and, and it's good to want to see the world and live in other places, but like, you shouldn't feel like that's your only option. And so I'm just, I always really appreciate stories that, um, you know, reflect that like, hey, this is, this is who we are. This is where we're from. This is home and that's okay. And whatever you decide to do, um, you know, your choices are valid. You have choices basically. Yeah. Um, and that's really important um, because I've even just like within a, the last week I've had people ask me, well, why don't you, why, why do you live there? Why don't you just move? It sounds terrible. And I'm like, it's, it's not like, um, you know, like David says, like they, you know, every place I think has, you know, some darkness and, and some not so good parts. But um, I also think that you can't only talk about the good or only talk about the bad without acknowledging that, you know, the opposite is true. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I really hope they get out of it. I do. I do love that. Um, and I know that, um, Melissa Wyatt, who wrote funny how things change, which is, um, a really cool, um, book set in rural America. I know like she's talked about before where her editor wanted the, the, the protagonist of it. Um, you know, he, he just wants to stay where he is. And I know that her editor, like, really wanted her to change that so um mm -hmm. and I love that you and you know she didn't she stuck with it but I love that what you're talking about because it's not like I think sometimes teens feel bad like like they should want to leave you know and some some of them do mm -hmm. and that's fine but like you don't have to and there's nothing wrong with you if you just love the place where you are and you feel exactly. really connected. so yeah. Oh my goodness. Stephanie, do we have, we're almost out of time. Like, are there any like questions? Actually, what at this point, cause we are almost out of time. Can, why don't, um, if you all have any books that you would like to recommend, um, for the folks in the audience, um, either other books that you, um, that you really love that tell role stories or not, you know, if it's just something that you're reading or something that you, that you would like to give a little boost to, um, we would love to share that. And we've, we've been posting links as we go and have posted a link to funny how things change as, as well um, in the chat. So everyone take a, take a look at the chat for, um, for books by our authors this evening um, and for the ones that they'll uh, recommend. So. And um, I just want to let, um, Shamila actually has, she's so famous. She has like another event. Oh. That she <laughs> So I just want to let her say goodbye to everyone and thank you so much for, for making time to do this event with us. It was so great to talk to you and see you. It was great. <laughs> of course, it was my honor. And you know how it is. My, my, YA, my debut YA just came out last month. And so uh, it's been just that onslaught. But I, I, I love this kind of events. Uh, and I always say that I wish I could bottle up the feeling of community, even though we're so far away, but technology allows us to to be nearby so that when the quiet comes, because it'll come, I can already feel it coming. Uh, I will remember all the support and, uh, and, and the relationships with my writer friends that, and that will fuel me to keep on writing. So thank you for having me. I love you all. Show bye me bye. The, thank you so much for, for spending time with us this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye, Camila. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, if you, if you all want to chime in, um, uh, someone just said, uh, Courtney just said, yes, OMG, yes, make my TBR <laughs> pile larger. So let's do that. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Here's a, you, I think you and, I think you and, and Josh Jr. need to go. Yes. This, yes, he's very, he's settled now, but um, so as far as books that have like, I think really good rural representation, um, YA, 
I really like the miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily Danforth. Like it's it's just it's really good. It's it's not a light read because it does have um, if anybody wants some content warnings, um, some you know anti um, some homophobia and you know violence towards um, queer teens. So just you know be aware of that. Um, but that was a book that I read when it came out and I was in college and I was just like blown away. I was like, I didn't know you could do this in YA. So that was very um, influential for me. I also really like um, Dress Codes for Small Towns by Courtney Stevens. That's a fantastic small town um, YA book. And then um, nonfiction, but real queer America by um, Samantha Allen is amazing. She is a trans journalist and she does this road trip across the United States and she hits up um, states that are considered red states in rural and remote communities and she talks to real queer people who live there and she interviews them about her their lives and their experiences and how they find community and I just found like so much of that book really resonated with me and my own experiences so I definitely recommend that book. Um, and then I just have to give a shout out to the book that I'm currently reading right now because Rachel Hilton is in the chat. I am currently reading Foreshadow YA, which is an anthology that's out next week. And Rachel has a short story in it and it is so good. So yes, definitely pick that one up too. <laughs> um, I would recommend, I'm just gonna recommend one because I can't like, I'm like, drawing a blank on stuff like this, but definitely Under the Mesquite by Guadalupe Garcia McCall is an amazing book. Uh, book a novel in verse why novel in verse um, that takes place in uh, a small border community if you've never read I mean it's just such a powerful beautiful book that will just break your heart and build you up again um, and it well Lupin and I are, are friends and we just finished co-authoring a book together she's just a magnificent writer um, who uh, comes from a transnational community like I do that's a, a town on the other side of the border both small little communities and um, if you want to experience what's what that's like in a, a lyrical uh, moving way definitely check that book out thank you nora oh um the let's see da, 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 i'm the smell of other people's houses um that's a really nice one i let's see melissa wyatt's book um there is Actually, I'll just give you, so there's the new award called the Whippoorwill Award, and it is given to um, books um, that, David's book is on it, um, that that show true, um, authentic, non-stereotyped rural representation. And so um, every year they pick 10 books. And so if you just check out that list, <laughs> that's a great place to go. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, it's always it's always great to have a, a bigger list to go to, and then you can uh, drill down from there and find find whatever appeals to you. I'm also going to throw out um, because um, a, a piece of of um, stereotypical representation was mentioned earlier, um, and I just want to. These are not YA, but a couple of of sort of of books that have come out as an ant as antidotes or. Um, uh, uh, responses to that book directly. One uh, is Appalachian Reckoning, which is a collection of writings by Appalachian writers. Um, that's that's um, really quite wonderful. You know, and they're all writers right, who who are from the region, live in the region, write about the region from from their own perspectives. Um, and also, what you're getting wrong about Appalachia, which is just sort of a pocket size kind of uh, guide that serves as a little bit of an antidote to um, to uh, some of what someone might draw from the previous mention, previously mentioned uh, book. One mention is enough per. I know, it's so funny. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned it. But no, no, I'm, I'm glad you did. Yeah, and I'm I glad you did. And I that trailer and oh my gosh. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's on Netflix. Everyone will, everyone knows what it is. <laughs> um, oh but we don't need, yeah, but we, we can just say it the one time. Yeah. Right. I have both of those books, Stephanie, and they're, they're really good. I, I read like the little pocket one, especially. Yeah. 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 And they are, they're just, they're just, and, and we're not, we're not going to tell anyone not to read the other book. Right. right. Um, because, because I, it's important to, to read, but I'm just going to say, if you're going to read that one, we recommend also reading these other ones and just to, <laughs> just, just to balance out the, yeah, to, to balance out. Or if you watch the, you know, if you watch it on TV, you know, then you have something to, to balance out. 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, and now it's 6.59. <laughs> so, um, I, I just want to say thank you all uh, so much, uh, for, again, for speaking with us uh, this evening. And just leave, leave you um, to, if you have anything else, any, any I, I've been saying final words or last words would sound very funereal, I realize, but that's not. <laughs> um, but if you have uh, just anything else that you would like to, to share this evening, thank you. Um, I just want people to know that um, this is not just a book for rural people. It's, I think if you're not rural, it's especially important that you read it. So um, I, I do hope you pick it up and that you discover um, some, you know, maybe your next favorite favorite author because there, there are some incredible, incredible contributors um, in this anthology. So please do check it out. Agreed. You're, um, I found so much to love in it, um, and and <laughs> my to be read pile is like getting bigger and bigger because I immediately went out and ordered books by a bunch of people. So uh, you you'll find something addictive in it. I promise you. Absolutely, and um, just yeah, thank you for supporting rural voices. I mean, you know, the title, but then also you know those of us who are rural and our stories because it means a lot. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. Thanks again um, to David and Tirza and Nora. Um, and uh, again, we do encourage you to pick up this wonderful book and and the other books by our authors uh, this evening. And there's there's I, I do want to mention too that that there are um, 15 authors altogether um, in the book. All wonderful, and it's it's a it's a it's a varied collection of rural voices, um, and uh, and and so a, a really enjoyable read. And thank you so much again, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. And we look forward to seeing y'all again at another event. Um, and thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all. having us. Our pleasure. Good night, everybody.